I find it a coincidence with uh, Brother Robert's prayer request about how to be zealous in something that is good, and that matches with my message today. Amen. All right, we're going to look at Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. This is a sermon that might be more sobering. It might be more serious and it will get you thinking a lot more. I believe that he laid it upon my heart to preach you this sermon. Acts chapter 22. We'll read verse 1. The Apostle Paul, he is in front of a, Jew, a bunch of Jews who held a riot and they want to kill him. And then Paul, before he was arrested by uh, Roman centurions... He was given a chance to speak uh, to his people, so he calmed down the protest, and then Paul gave his chance to speak. In the end, if you know what happened, <coughs> his speech did not work, and the Jews wanted him to be thrown into prison at the end. But Paul's speech is something where I see as, some, as very important, and it has a lot of answers to the greatest sin he committed. Verse 1, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And when they heard, <coughs> and when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are, this day, and I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. We see Paul's past mention that before I was a safe Christian, I would persecute Christians. I was a Jew of the Jews. I'm like one of you. So all of you would understand what I'm trying to tell you to those Jews who protested against him, who wanted to see him dead. So he tried to empathize with his people, try to make them understand that he was very anti-Christian back then, that he was very zealous and hardcore into Judaism like his fellow Jews. And that's something that made me notice here, especially the last part of verse 3, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. So Paul saying, I am just as passionate, as zealous as you. And that's, once I noticed that, I wondered if his past sin he was still committing in his ministry. You might say, well, pastor, no, he wasn't persecuting Christians. But that wasn't the sin. That wasn't the real sin that, uh, that uh, he committed. That was one of the sins that resulted from his real sin. You might say, what is his real sin? It's his constant problem that he had in the past that he committed even right now at Acts 2, what he was committing right now. You might say, what is that? His greatest sin <coughs> is serving God very faithfully. All right, now before you walk out the door and <laughs> sell me to death for blasphemy, let me explain this. Come on, brother. Notice the last part of verse 3, zealous toward God as ye all are this day. Wasn't he serving God faithfully? In his mind, he was. In his eyes, he was. But why is he still wrong? I mean, he just did it from the sincerity of his heart, trying to serve God faithfully, hardcore. What was his problem? It's simple. He contradicted God's word. That's the simple answer. Do you see so many people who say they love Jesus, who are passionate, sincere, and very zealous, for their God, for their religion, and not just Jesus, but they are sincerely wrong. Sometimes a Catholic may be serving God more faithfully than you. You might say, why? Because grandma would be the one walking around that pagan statue of the Virgin Mary on her bloody knees, and she'd be more dedicated than you are. But that doesn't mean that she's right and you're wrong. She's still wrong. And if she's not saved, then she's going to die in her sins and burn in hell. What? How can God do that? Simple. You just don't follow His word. It's very simple. You forgot the verse. The Bible says what Samuel told Saul, obedience yeah. is better, yeah. better than sacrifice. That's right, yeah. It's what Paul said, even though I give my body to be burned, 
and have not charity, what? I am nothing. The Apostle Paul's greatest sin was he served God too faithfully. That's why he had that argument with Barnabas. Why? Because John Mark was going to hold them back in serving God, in his serving God hardcore, faithfully. That's why they had that ugly fight with Bar uh, he had that ugly fight with Barnabas. That's why he's sinning right now at Acts 22. What? He wasn't supposed to go to Jerusalem. God told him, you're supposed to go to uh, the Gentiles. You're supposed to go to Rome. But he disobeyed God. Why? Because he just had a burden for his people and he wanted to see them and get saved. And he's like, Lord God, I'm willing to die for you. And God's like, I don't care. What did I tell you? Don't go. That was his greatest sin. And you know what's really sad is that I think that there's a good number of people here that are committing the same thing as the Apostle Paul. They have a heart for the Lord, a passion for the Lord, and they're serving God faithfully, and your record attendance in our church is stellar and faithful. But have you been committing the greatest sin of Paul as well? All this time? Something you have to ask yourself. I hope this sermon will open your eyes. The title of my message today is, What is the Apostle Paul's Greatest Sin? God, my Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. Help me to preach what is truth according to your word and not to my own ways and my own doings. And I pray that these people's hearts will be receptive not to the flesh but to you. May you move. May you become real to them. And may uh, these sins be repented of. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Let's look at verse 3 through 4. Verses 3 through 4. My first point is the arousal of Paul. The arousal of Paul. Something aroused him. At verse 3 to 4. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day, and I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. See, he was aroused to serve God Faithfully with a passion that he didn't care if he were to torture men, women, and children. Something aroused him to serve God so faithfully to do that. But what started it was the first part of verse 4. Brought, uh, verse 3, excuse me. First part of verse 3, the middle of it. Yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. You don't get passionate and serve God hardcore unless you experienced or heard something first. I mean, that's how some of you got right with the Lord, right? What was it? A summer camp experience, maybe? A certain preaching that convicted you? Some personal trial you went through and the Lord met you and then taught you the hard way and then you opened your eyes? Was it uh, through the testimony of your brothers and sisters or people that you know that kind of made you see the light? And then what happened was because of these things that influenced you, <laughs> that's what made you on the road to serve God faithfully, right? Nothing wrong with that. But what could be wrong is what if what you heard and what you experienced were actually the wrong things? Could it also have an opposite effect? Think about today's people. How they became so hardcore, left-wing, socialist, communist-minded. Right, right. They didn't just become that way. Right. They heard or experienced something. Yeah. They experienced oppression in their Christian home and tradition. And saw that the, their parents were hypocrites in church and were unloving. They saw the scandals going on in their church, home churches. That's what made them hardcore atheists. They heard something from their universities and their professors that convicted them, that made them repent and change their beliefs and made them hardcore left-wing all the way. Right. So what's my point here? My point is, if you're going by what you hear and what you experience to arouse you to serve God all the way and to dedicate your life, you better be careful. Yeah. Because that's not rooted in the Holy Spirit. That's rooted in the flesh. That's good, brother. Yeah. You know that? Look, there's nothing wrong to get moved by the preaching and emotionally stirred. The Holy Spirit could use the emotions of the flesh. But how do you know 100% of the time 
that the Holy Spirit is moving your emotions or your emotions are being moved up by itself. Uh, that's good, Pastor. Well, how can I tell? Just go by the Word of God. It's that simple. Amen. It's that simple. When you have the Word of God, everything is simple. It's not complex. It sounds complex, I know, when I'm, trying to, when I'm saying everything to you. But I want you to understand this. That's how complex sin is. Yes. But when you're in the Bible, the Word of God, it's simple. It should be easy. It's like, just simple. If the Bible says it, I do it. If it doesn't say it, I don't do it. If my feelings get stirred by the Bible, good. If it doesn't, so what? Tough luck. I'll just follow the Bible. See, that's the point there. Now, the Bible says at Galatians 5.24, pay attention, it says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh, but what's accompanying the flesh? With the affections and lust. How can you go by fleshly sensations and think that they are your top guideline to serve the Lord? Well, because I felt this, or I saw this, or I heard this. Uh, the Lord was, was telling me something, and you know what you preach there, Pastor, made me do this, and etc. Be careful. How do you not know that you're going by fleshly sensations? Come on, bro. Your mind being stirred, your heart being stirred, you know, uh, uh, the emotions, the sensations kicking in. Sadness, conviction, etc. Excitement. Are you truly going by the Word of God or by fleshly sensations? That's what you have to be looking at. Good preaching. You have to be looking at that. What aroused you to... I mean, think about it. Uh, imagine that you're that missionary who sacrificed wife, children, and everything to go in the foreign field and that uh, you're suffering persecution over there and that you're trying to plan a church, trying to win souls to salvation and imagine at the end you were told by God, no, that wasn't my will for you to be a missionary. How would you feel after that? You'd be mentally deranged and gets broken. I don't know what you might go, go through, a mental breakdown or something. Right, right. But why would that missionary make that mistake to begin with? Because he didn't go by the word of God to begin with. He went by what he thought was the right way to go that would please the Lord. That's and that's a fleshly sensation. Okay. How you feel, how you think. You trust what you feel? You trust what you think? Why don't you just go by the word of God? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. The, word of God. the word of God is plain and clear. And it will never guide you what is wrong. Be careful what you're hearing. Right now, what you're seeing, what you're feeling right now, are you going by how the Holy Spirit's dealing you with the Word of God right now? Or are you just doing it because it's just a good a speech that I'm giving to you right now? Because there's going to come a time I can't give a good speech to you. I might just preach a boring message and then see if you really get right with God after that. You better, uh, go, you better not go by your fleshly sensations. You've got to go by what is God trying to tell me here. What is the word of God speaking to me that I need to get right with? My second point is a testing of Paul. A testing of Paul. If you look at verse 5, there are people who attest to his testimony that this is real, that what Paul did was legit against the Christians. He was a Jew of the Jews. Verse 5. As also the high priest doth bear me witness in all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. So uh, Paul, he has evidence. He has people who can attest to what he did. And that's the problem is that Paul, his life record already was ruined. He already has a wicked past that's messed up. His zeal, his passion, his hardcore dedication to serve the Lord was all wrong, sinful, and he killed people. And guess what? There are people who can attest to that. At verse 5. You know what's going to be sad? What you don't realize is this, is that you might be extremely dedicated to God and you have a passion and you're a hardcore. And I'm going to do this for you, Lord. But you don't realize that maybe 10 years later, you recognize, oh, what I did was wrong. I got to correct it right here. Oh, what I did actually was hurtful. What I did was sinful. But guess what? Ten years already passed and you got a whole bunch of witnesses and people who attest to what kind of person you are. And that's going to stain on your life record. 
And in the future, when you try to serve God, some people are going to be judging you by your past and seeing, I wonder if what he's doing right now, oh, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm doing this. Oh, I wonder if that connects to his past when he said the same thing. I'm doing this for the Lord, but it was wrong. Am I making any sense yeah, right here? Yeah, Am I making any sense right here? Yeah, it's good. Right, right. You have to be careful of that. People attest to what you do. And you don't think about the consequences of people who can attest to what you do. If you think about the, the consequences of your service to the Lord, then you would be more wise on how you serve the Lord. You would think twice. You would frame it into a better way. Or maybe you just abandon it altogether and realize I was just completely wrong to begin with. I got to find what's right to serve the Lord. Think about this. If your service, if your service for the Lord hurts others, uh, if it hurts others more than helping them, you have to truly, honestly look at your heart and ask yourself, I ever wonder if I thought about other people or if I was thinking about how I felt. You have to think about that. You have to think about, was I thinking about how uh, other people, when I did this action that hurt others rather than help them, was I really truly thinking about them or was I thinking about how I felt? Can you honestly say that nothing of yourself is in it when you made that decision? Because, you know, I, if you're not doing that, then you're sinning because the Bible says that Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You have to look at others. And what immediately follows, it says, let this mind. Yeah. Be in you. Amen. And gives the example of Jesus Christ who did it for others yep. and not for himself. Amen. You have to keep that in your mind. Are you thinking about others? As we go through the coronavirus crazy situations, that's how I always done, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to think about others. Not for myself. What makes me happy? If I did it my own way, you wouldn't want to know how I would do how I would do things, all right? You wouldn't come back to my church after that. But you got to be careful of that. That's why you have to be careful with that attitude because when you keep looking at how you feel, how you feel, how you're spiritually convicted, then you're going to look at your own spiritual convictions, right? Then when you look at your own spiritual convictions, you're going to judge other people's standards with their spiritual walk with Jesus Christ by your own spiritual conviction. And you're going to think that they're sinning, they're not right with God because they just don't compare to your level of how you spiritually walk with Jesus Christ. Well, how do you not know that the person who has a different spiritual conviction from you, that they have every good reason for the decision that they made, that the Lord was guiding them to a different path. You better watch out for that attitude. That's why Romans 14 is so true that you have to go by what you're spiritually convicted, but you cannot use that as a stumbling block against brethren who have a different spiritual conviction. And you might say, why would God do that? Why would God do that? Simple. Because God leads everybody in a different path with their different personalities, different background, different situation, and uses them for different ways for the glory of God. Yes. Yeah. And not only that, what people are struggling with is different from other people what they're struggling with yeah. and God knows exactly what their gift is what their sin is and this other person what his gift is what his sin is and guess what it's all going to conflict with each other right. Yeah, right. Amen, preacher. there are people who ha might have a clean conscience to watch on television and other people who says I can't even watch a single thing on television that's Better be careful of that. Oh, you know, the person didn't, didn't come to church today and I wonder what happened. Why didn't you come out? Watch out for that attitude. Yeah. Oh, you didn't pass out as many tracks as I did. Why don't you give out everything? Watch out for that attitude. Mm -hmm. Oh, I preached as loud as I could so that other people can hear me. Why weren't you as loud as me? You better watch out for that attitude. Mm -hmm. That is a wrong service for the Lord and you're serving God wrongly. Yes. Amen. You better watch out for that. Otherwise, you're just maybe wasting your life then, like Paul. Come on, yeah. Serving God the wrong way. Watch out for that. My third point is affliction of Paul. Affliction of Paul. Verse 6 through 9. Verses 6 through 9. 
And it came to pass that I, as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Notice here that Jesus said that, Hey, Paul, guess what? All the service that you did for me, that you thought that you were pleasing me, that you were making me happy, guess what? You are actually persecuting me. You are actually torturing me. Right. You know what's going to be very sad is that what you thought was, I'm serving God so faithfully, hardcore with a passion. But in, the, but in reality, you aren't actually pleasing the Lord. You are actually hurting Him. You are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. And you're making Jesus as if he's being crucified on the cross again. Yes. That's good. You're just afflicting Jesus. Every time that you thought that you're doing something spiritual, you are afflicting Jesus at the same time. That's good, you better watch. That's why you have to be careful how you serve the Lord. You've got to observe yourself. Yes. Are you really serving God the right way? Is what your action doing, what you said, your attitude, is it truly serving the Lord the right way or are you actually crucifying Jesus again and grieving the Holy Spirit of God again? Imagine, man. Can you imagine? Like, uh, that would be a horrible thing. Your whole life spent on what you thought was right and you're serving God very faithfully and you're, you're hardcore into it. I'm going to do it all the way and nothing's going to move my mind and you, were, and you stuck to it. Yeah, I didn't give up for Jesus. At the judgment seat of Christ, you expected that God says, I'm proud of you, and here's a bunch of rewards because you sacrificed so much for me. But imagine at the judgment seat of Christ that Jesus said, no, you actually didn't make me happy. You hurt me. Your world will crash. Why am I preaching this message? Because I don't want you to be that person whose world crashed. That your whole life was a lie. That you messed up your life. And that you hurt yourself. That's good. Imagine Jesus took you home to heaven and you thought that it's because I laid down my life for Jesus. And Jesus said, no, because I had to take you home early because your service was hurting me so much that I had to make sure that you die and go to heaven and wow. just get it over with. On, Imagine your street preaching, your track passing, your soul winning, your church attendance, your right doctrine, your spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. All of it was just grieving Jesus, hurting God. Can it? Yeah, of course it can. Mm -hmm. If you don't follow the word of God. If you don't follow the word of God. You got to follow the way the Bible guides you. There are people, uh, I know of a family, I've used this several times from a different Bible believing church. He was soul winning, soul winning, and getting so many souls saved. But then this person was neglecting uh, his family. And then the wife got upset and contacted the pastor and said, he needs to go back to his job and pay his bills. And the pastor, you think he was happy when he heard about those souls saved? He got mad. It was like saying, I thought that you were doing a great thing, but I didn't know what you were doing. Yeah. See? That's good. You thought Bible reading and prayer was a great thing and you're so dedicated for Jesus Christ? Not if you're reading the wrong Bible. Mm -hmm. right. There's one right Bible. That's the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't have time to defend the King James Bible, explain what's wrong with modern Bible versions. But even scholars, all scholars, no matter what they are, they know that the modern Bible versions come from Alexandrian manuscript text. Even the New King James Version adopted some Alexandrian yeah. readings, right. even though they claim to be traditional texts. Mm -hmm. Imagine spending your whole time reading the Bible, but that was something that the Lord's not pleased with. Yeah. He wants you to read His right book. Yeah. I mean, if you don't think so, you think that God will be happy if you read a Jehovah Witness Bible? I mean, it's a, it's a modern translation. Why is it wrong? Because you know they change verses that change doctrine, right? That's the same thing with the modern Bible versions. They change verses that change doctrine. If you don't know about that, you can ask me after church and I'll be, uh, I'll be very happy to show you. I'm not going to be mean about it. Because a lot of people over here didn't know before too. Yeah. Are you hurting Jesus with your service, your church attendance, your, how you're living for the Lord? Look at yourself. My fourth point is adherence of Paul. The adherence of Paul. Look at verses 10 through 11. Verses 10 through 11. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, <clears throat> and go into Damascus, and there shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, 
being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. Notice right here at verse 10, Paul, he's like, what am I going to do, Lord? And God says, you're going to be told what to do. And not only that, Paul couldn't do anything. At verse 11, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't do any service for the Lord. He was handicapped. He had to have somebody guide him. That's good, brother. You know what the problem with people who serve God very faithfully is? Listen up now. You might be surprised about this. Their problem is they cannot sit still. They always have to do something, do something. What did Paul say? What shall I do, Lord? What shall I do? And God's like, you're going to sit down and shut up and you're going to be told what to do. Why? Why? Amen. And, you're, and guess, uh, why didn't God cure him of his blindness right then and there? No, you need to wait a couple days right. and reflect. Yeah, that's good. But I'm working so hard for the ministry, Pastor. I'm helping out the men. I'm helping out the ladies. I'm helping out the children. I'm working so hard. And maybe God wants you to just stop. Yeah. Yeah. Take a couple weeks off because you're a workaholic. Yeah. And you're using the ministry as an excuse. That's good. You're going more by your burden yeah. rather than the will of God. Come on. Right. Right. Yeah. You ever thought about that? Oh, I'm working so hardcore for Jesus Christ. Well, don't blame God for that, uh, the hardships you're going through. Blame yourself. If you're the one that created it and it wasn't God's will. That's good. You know what your problem is? You can't adhere. That's your problem. You always do stuff. You don't adhere. You have a problem with listening. Romans 10.2, the Bible says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. So see, it's for God. I have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. How do you get knowledge? I'll tell you how you get knowledge. <laughs> Hello? Do you listen? That's right. Oh, that's gross. No, okay. <laughs> Do you listen? Do you hear what God is trying to tell you? That's good. I mean, or are you prideful? You think that you're spiritual. You have it all made that you know what's right and that's why you keep doing it and you're stubborn and you're hardcore and you say, I'm just fighting out for Jesus. No, you got a pride issue. That's your problem. You got a pride issue. Why? Because you refuse to listen. Didn't you know your pastor here, he listens to other preachers? No, he don't listen. Yeah, I listen to other preachers. All right? I listen to other preachers. I listen to counsel. You know why? Because I want to serve God the right way. That's right. Not what I think is the right way. Because too many people think that they're right in the way to serve God. I don't want to be one of those. Yeah. You need to humble yourself. That's your problem. You got a humility issue. You don't, you, you're not willing to humble yourself. So when God gives you right doctrine from His Word, then you better adhere to that and don't be prideful. If God gives you preachers that instruct you on this is, uh, no, don't do this, do it this way, then you better watch out for that. You better watch out where you have this mindset of, I'm going to do things my way. And when you do that, then don't think the Lord's going to bless you. He wants to see humble people. You better watch out for that. That's why it's so important to attend a Bible-believing church, to grow in a Bible-believing church. You might say, why? Why should I? You know, I can go to as many churches. Then why would I even plan a church here? Mm, come on. All right, there are plenty of churches. You know, I might as well go to a country that needs a Christian church, right? Wow. Why would I plant one here? You know why? Because churches are falling into apostasy. They're not teaching right doctrine. Right. And because of that, people are just serving God the wrong way. Wow, they're so passionate for Jesus when they clap their hands and girly guys are dancing with pink clouds because they think that they're worshiping Jesus and God is pleased. No, that's sin and worldly. Right. Yeah, that's right. And it disgusts God. Yeah. You have to see that uh, when you serve Jesus Christ, are you, listen, are you a listener or are you a person that gets offended who doesn't listen? You know who are the people who serve God well? When they constantly listen. Yes. They don't talk first, they listen. They don't do first, they listen. Yes. They don't feel first, they listen. Yes. They don't think first, they listen. Amen. They listen from the Word of God. Is that in the Word of God? Let me pray about what pastors say and see if that's what the Lord wants me to do. They listen. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. 
That's why, wow, so uh, if you skip a Bible study class, then you might miss out a salient right doctrine that you didn't know about. God forbid some of you are already uh, teaching or saying some wrong doctrinal stuff during fellowship time. You might say, is that possible? Of course it's possible, no matter how sincere you are. If you don't know much doctrine, you might say something wrong. You might recommend a wrong preacher. You might say Charles Stanley. You might say John MacArthur. You might say, I watched this online. This guy's a really great guy, Joel Osteen. You might say something wrong by accident. And our church is not going to be mean and judgmental, but it shows that you don't know what's right. And then imagine that no one told you what was right all those years, and then you get upset at me. Pastor, why didn't you tell me what I was, list, uh, what I was saying or what I was doing was wrong? That's your fault. You're right. That's what I'm telling you now. And that's what other pastors don't have the guts to do. That's why they don't call out names. They don't point out right doctrine. You know why? They could care a lick. They just want people to fill up the pews. And as long as we all love Jesus, that's great. Not when it's done in the wrong way for the Lord. Calvinism is sent from hell and it's wrong. Anti-dispensationalism is sent from hell and it's wrong. To teach that, you have to uh, have a certain amount of good works to prove that you're genuinely saved and make people fearful of their salvation is sent from hell and it's wrong. Did I offend some of you just now? You know what, you know what that is? See, that's feeling. That's feeling again because you have your own way of serving God and now what I'm saying is conflicting with yours. Either uh, you're right and I'm wrong or I'm right and you're wrong and you better start to study and check it for yourself what's the matter with some of you good, brother. Come on, brother. instead of just walking out and uh, going <laughs> and then getting offended Amen. and never Come coming back Amen. Come on. why don't you study for yourself hey if I'm wrong then come on study come on. I'm a heretic then prove it right, right. alright I don't want you to just come here like a robot and say oh we love Jesus let's have a great time not when something's done wrong right right Good preaching, brother. Come yeah, on. My fifth point is assisting of Paul. Assisting of Paul. Let's look at verse 12 to 13. Verses 12 to 13. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. So notice that Paul, he got his sight back. But how he got his sight back and how he is able to become the great apostle Paul was because there was a great Ananias. And to have a great Ananias is because he just assisted Paul. You know, Paul is better and greater than Ananias, you know that? But God had to teach this great man humility first that you need an Ananias to heal you. You need to realize I'm wrong, he's right, I'm going to listen to him. Right. Isn't that what the Bible showed? Yeah, it shall be told of thee what thou shalt do. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what God told him. So you know what, you, what we need in the church? Listen up, this is important church. Aren't we Bible believers? Don't we know right doctrine? Then the job of the fifth point is we are to assist these Pauls who, are, who have a passion and love for Jesus Christ but are in the wrong way. If they say something wrong, recommend something wrong, do something wrong, it is your job as a Bible-believing church to assist and to guide them. I'm not saying for you to judge them, be mean, pretend you're more spiritual than them, and pretend that you can correct them in anything. No, guide them. Assist them. Show them that, hey, you know, actually, <clears throat> this preacher that you recommended me from his book, uh, that guy, you know he's a heretic, right? He teaches this kind of doctrine. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me. Right, right. They might thank you for that one, all right? Yeah. If you don't want to say heretic, just say something nicer. You know that uh, our church don't teach like this guy, right? He teaches something wrong, actually. Right. Yeah. Say something nicer. I don't care, you know? The point is, is that you need to assist these people. That's your job. That's not the pastor's job all the time because if we get 2,000 people in our church, you think I can keep track of 2,000 people? It is the job of the church to assist each other. Right. Yeah. Does the pastor do, uh, pick up everybody to go to church? No. He needs 
assisting people. Does a pastor preach every single time and teach every single time? No, he needs people to assist him. Does a pastor greet everybody and fellowship with everybody? No, he needs people to assist him. Does a pastor show people what is wrong in doctrine to every single person? No, he needs people to assist him. That's good, brother. And that is your job. Don't be fearful. Don't be scared. If you really love the brother and sister in Christ, I'm not telling you to correct them or judge them. Just guide them. That's good, brother. Just be a help to them, a blessing to them. That's the thing. But the thing is, is that the Ananias is those who have a good report. See that at verse 12? It's those who's a good report, those who follow according to the law, right? So this, uh, do you follow? Let's, uh, do you do you follow the law, the regulation of your local Bible believing church and Bible believing pastor? Do you follow the law and regulation? Are you fully familiar? Do you have a good report amongst them? Then you're the person that people would depend upon to assist other people. Amen. That's what you're supposed to do. If you're not. And you've just been coming just some Sundays here and there, then you're not that person, and you're supposed to be the Paul, not the Ananias. Was that deep for you? Mm-hmm. Let me repeat that again, all right? Come on. You, you're, uh, you're not the Ananias because you're not familiar with everything the pastor teaches and preaches in a local Bible believing church, and you don't have that good report where people would depend upon. So because you don't have that kind of background and reputation, then you must be the guy who's probably the one who needs to listen more, who needs to learn more, right? If you learn more and then you're familiar more, then the people would depend on you, right? It's a given in our church. Some people know who to depend on. It's a given. There were people who would ask certain questions to certain people because it's a given. It's shown from your testimony. Why? They've seen you attend church all the time. They've seen you how you talk to pastor all the time. They've seen you talk about doctrinal stuff with the pastor. They've seen you how you faithfully uh, knew about the pastor's character and etc. They know. They know. So if you don't have that kind of reputation or that kind of testimony, you need to be the Paul, not the Ananias. Because if you're trying to be the Ananias, guess what? You're back to Paul again yeah. in being judgmental and telling people what to do, what you think is right, when what you think is right differs from Bible-believing churches and pastors and Bible believers in general. You have to be familiar with how those people think, of, uh, how those people think and practice for the Lord. That's why uh, I'm not just a tip. Online people, you have to watch out for them. They're in their own world. They can teach whatever they want. But me, when I go online, I'm accountable to other Bible-believing pastors and church th- churches. I put them in my website. That shows right here, see, that I'm held accountable with them. I don't go my own little thing. You want to be an Ananias? You have to have a good report amongst people first. You have to have that. <clears throat> so then, don't be, the, uh, don't be the Ananias. Be the Paul. Listen. But if you're that Ananias, you need to assist those Pauls. That's your job. And if you're not sure, well, I'm not sure if I'm an Ananias or if I'm a Paul, then simply ask an Ananias. Isn't that simple? (laughs) Just ask an Ananias, what do you think? And the Ananias will say, no, what you said was right, actually. You should say that. Or, yeah, at that certain level, you are wise to stop and let me handle it. Give it to an Ananias then, all right? I remember this uh, this one wicked person who, Trolled inside our church, you know, just adore James White stuff. But then he trolled inside the church just to catch us and just to give us a hard time. And uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but if my memory serves me, person asked Sister Jenny, you know, what do you think about the King James Bible or modern versions? And you know what she did? She said, oh, and then she referred to Brother Robert. (laughs) Oh, why don't you ask him? Maybe he can help you with that one. You know why that troll wanted to catch somebody in our church to say something wrong? Right. And then say, oh, Pastor Kim's people teach this kind of stuff. He, that, that, that guy's a wicked guy. He, guess what? He didn't stay for second service. You know what? He was a coward because I had some Ananiases here who talked to him. And then I had some Pauls there who knew better and let Ananias handle them. And this Ananias here, he can just take a vacation and do whatever he wants. <laughs> amen. Amen, 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 brother. Yeah. 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 
You know, that's, you know what that is? We're assisting each other. Amen. We're helping each other. That's Amen. what a body of Christ should do. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. If you're a Paul, listen. If you're an Ananias, do something. If you're not sure if you're a Paul or an Ananias, ask an Ananias. My sixth point. It, my sixth point is the ability of Paul. The ability of Paul. Look at verses 14 through 16. Verses 14 through 16. I'm not going to read it for time's sake. But notice that Ananias tells him, Look, Paul, you have an ability. And God knows that. So God chose you to be a witness to the Gentiles. And he tells him at verse 16, Why, What are you waiting for? Go out and do it. Now that's Paul's green light to serve the Lord. To be zealous and passionate and hardcore. He got the green light but he had to listen first. He had to heed to an Ananias first. And then he knew what his green light was. You know what your problem is, is that you're so bound to your service for the Lord that you're wasting the actual spiritual gift that God has given to you to be zealous for Him. So basically you've been zealous for the wrong things and not been using the gift, the actual real gift that you should have been zealous for for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12 says, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. <clears throat> Aren't you uh, the one that's passionate, hardcore, serving God faithfully, the one with zeal? Yes! Then use your spiritual gift, your actual gift. Amen. And use it to edify the church. Right. Don't Amen. go your own way and feel like, well, I'm doing this to please Jesus and God must be proud of me even though I acted like a jerk, jerk and offended so many people. No, you're not right with God. That's right. That's right. I mean, if you are so zealous to serve God wrongly all this time, I don't get it why you can't be zealous to serve God rightly. All you have to do is just switch it. Yeah. All you have to do is just switch it. I mean, so simple. Just switch it. Right. You know your problem is? See, you're prideful. You're stubborn. You want to stick to your own way. Mm-hmm. See, that's flesh. That's right. Thank God then. Amen. Thank you, Lord. What is your spiritual gift? You know what some of you are doing? You're not even using your spiritual gift. Oh, we need a special over here. We need a person to help out with the nursery, a person to help out with teaching the kids, a person who can teach and preach for the pastor, a person who can help welcome people, a person who can just even come here or pray for the brethren. You're not even using those gifts. You know what your problem is? You're seeking after your own selfish gifts, what you prefer, not the gifts God has given to you. If I want to be hardcore in something, it's the gift that God has given to me. And if God gave me that gift to draw and to teach, and I'll tell you what, I still hate drawing to this day, but if that's a gift God has given to me, I'm going to use it to the best of my ability to bless the people and the church. And it did. The Lord mightily used it. If God called you to use the gift of being the tech guy for the work, then bless God, put a smile on your faces and say, be zealous and hardcore and do the tech work for Jesus Christ. Amen. And don't say, no, I don't want to do the tech work. I want to be the preacher. I want to be the teacher. Maybe you just stink when you teach and preach, guys. Maybe you just stink and maybe God didn't call you. Amen. Praise God. I'm just being, I'm just being mean. I'm just being mean. Yeah. They, they, they preach real well. They preach really well. Yeah, they preach really well. They just do tech better so they have to stick to that one. <laughs> yeah, amen, brother, right there. <laughs> Why don't, so the point is you have to look at your ability, what you're using for the Lord. Amen. Don't waste it with the wrong thing. My seventh point is actions of Paul. Actions of Paul. If you look at verse 17 through 18, we won't read it for time's sake, but you notice right here that Paul, he went to Jerusalem... And he was praying. So he's being very spiritual. But then verse 18, God says, no, you need to get out of Jerusalem. You're in the wrong place. Right. <laughs> what, what? Verse 17. This looks spiritual, right? Do you see anything wrong in verse 17? He went to Jerusalem. Why? To witness to those Jews. To give them the gospel. And he was praying. I prayed about this. I fasted about this. Not wrong, but verse 18, God's like, no, you're in the wrong place. Get out yeah. of there. 
What was Paul? He made the same mistake he did in his lost days. You know what that was? The seventh point is his actions. The reason why he kept serving God wrongly was he acted first. He didn't really spend time with the Lord and seeking his will on that. That's the key. He wasn't going by the word of God. How many times did the word of the Lord tell Paul, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. Told him like three to four to five times, don't go. And Paul just went anyway. And he was praying? What a spiritual guy. No. (laughs) He was not right with the Lord. And God said, Paul, you know what I told you. Get out of there. You keep making the same mistake. You act, you don't listen. That is your big problem. You know, it's common. You got to watch your flesh because a lot of times we perceive things the way we perceive things and think that what we're doing is spiritual for the Lord. I mean, it's natural. It's a given to come to church. Natural given to read your Bible, pray, and to show what is wrong doctrine, to teach what is right doctrine, to witness to a soul how to get saved. All of these are naturally given and we just do these things. But you know, your problem is that you just act out those things as if it's a normal thing to do when you don't really take time to contemplate and see, am I really doing what's right for the Lord? That's good, brother. You just act and do it. That's your problem. That's right, that is your problem. You just act and do it. And you need to take time and be wary and open eye and observant to see whatever goes wrong. And the Lord will show you. He'll show you if what you're doing is wrong. So don't worry. All right? I'm not telling you to be paranoid, you know. The Lord will show you, but don't be blind and stubborn to not see it. You need to pray and be humble. Lord, if I'm doing what's wrong, show me. Lord, if I'm doing what's wrong, show me. If you do that, the Lord will show you. But you don't even do that. You don't even pray about that, do you? You don't even look at your heart and say, I could be wrong, do you? My eighth point is the analysis of Paul. The analysis of Paul. If you look at verses 19 through 20, 19 through 20, notice that Paul, he didn't agree with the Lord. He argued with him. Why? He argued because he was analyzing. And when he analyzed, he said, Lord, if you analyze along with me, what do you mean? Paul, he created your brain. He knows what you're thinking. God's... Paul's like, God, follow along with my analysis here. The Jews know that I hated Christians and that I imprisoned and persecuted them. And even Stephen, the first Christian martyr, I was there at the, uh, at the, at the first martyr with Stephen, Lord. So, I mean, Lord, the Jews would listen to me, not to a bunch of fishermen like Peter, James, and John. And God's like, no, they would listen to them, not you, trust me. But I'm a scholar of the Jews, God don't care. The problem with people who serve God wrongly, listen up now, is that I'm not saying what you do do is a dumb thing. A lot of things you do to serve the Lord is a smart thing. You analyze it. And you have your analysis. You have your reasons for the way you're serving God. But one thing I've learned, look, okay, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I'm at least some level of smarts with you, okay? I'm not a dummy either, okay? So I have at least some level of smarts with you. No matter how smart you are, God always taught me this. It doesn't matter how good your reasons are, Gene. It's wrong. That's good. And I showed it to you. Amen. And I don't know how much more I have to show it to you until you get the memo. Does it, do I, do I say, oh, to joy, okay, Lord, I'll change? No, it hurts me. Because everything that I've done to serve God so hard and faithfully, I would say it was wrong that I I need to correct something right here. You know what you need to spend time analyzing? Not how right you are. You need to analyze your flesh instead. You need to analyze, is this truly done because of my desire and pride? Right, right. Or am I doing this? Uh, is, that, is there something that's of my own desire and pride that needs to be sacrificed? My last point. Abandonment of Paul. Abandonment of Paul. Verse 21. Yes. If you look at verse 21, God tells Paul to basically abandon ship. Depart. Get out of there. I'm going to send you 
far away out of there to the Gentiles. You know what that meant? When Paul was so hardcore to lay down his life for Jesus Christ and let the Jews do anything to him, when he did that hardcore service for Jesus Christ and that hardcore sacrifice for Jesus Christ, he was so far away from where God wanted him to be to preach to the Gentiles. You know what I'm basically telling you? Think about this. God forbid that your hardcore sacrifice and efforts for Jesus is actually being hardcore in being further away from Him. You want a great example? The Pharisees. They they were hardcore in the law, doing everything and trying to be the ideal model. But you know what? They were the furthest away from Jesus Christ and Jesus rebuked them harder than the prostitutes and the crooked tax collectors. No wonder they hated Jesus, right? Just like some of you right now. When you're told that that's wrong, get right, and you go, how dare you? I've done, you know, I've I've tithed a thousand dollars today, pastor, to your ministry. I don't care. You can, I don't care about that. And God don't care about your money either. You know, some of you might be a little upset or discouraged when you're told that the way you served God was wrong. But I want to actually close the message, not that you feel discouraged about that your whole service for the Lord is wrong. I don't want you to feel depressed, distraught. I want to encourage you. What way? You know, you have the zeal to serve the Lord, right? Amen. Amen. If you have the zeal that I'm going to do whatever you want me to do, Lord, right? If you have that zeal, then if you have all that zeal to serve the Lord, why not have the zeal to repent then? Isn't that serving the Lord? Isn't that pleasing your Lord? Didn't Revelation 3, 19 say, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Use the zeal to repent. Lord, I'm happy to change to what you want me to do, to give up my way of doing things. I would gladly lay it down. Let me close it with this. You, you, you might think that, no, I have to keep sticking to this and serve God so faithfully. The Lord's going to be pleased with what I do. What's going to please God more than all the sacrifices you can ever lay at His feet is the zeal to repent more than your zeal to serve God your own way of doing things. Trust me, you will please God more by coming down on this altar and repenting and get right with God. Every head bow and every eye shut, the altar call is open. If you have that hardcore zeal, that desire, that passion for the Lord, why not use it in repentance? Why not reflect your ways? Here's some time where you can pray on the altar's floor here or even in your own seats and take some time to pray and examine yourself. I'm so happy you came to church today. And you know what? You try to make the pastor happy, the people happy. You're very good to us. You tithe well. You try to attend the services. You participate some way in soul winning. But you got to examine your service because... It would be so sad you attended our church all these years and you wasted your time. You wasted your service for the Lord because there's something that you did was fleshly. Your own way of doing things. God, examine your heart and say, Lord, if there's something that I need to get right with you. If some of you don't know, It's pretty simple. You just need to know the Word of God. It's that simple. You need to go by biblical authority. You need to go by the authority God has given to the church and the leaders who are Bible believers who go by the Word of God. By going by them, then you'll be steered constantly in the right direction. That's all you have to do. Your problem is you refuse to adhere. You want to just do things. Do, 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 do. Make the decision yourself. God don't like that. The Lord will guide you and lead you into all truth. 
That's why you need to spend time in the Word. You need to believe every right doctrine. You need to know the wrong doctrines. You need to renounce them. You need to be humble. You got to attend a Bible-believing church. If we have a Bible study time, try to attend as much as you can so you don't miss out something. We have them online now. Watch them. You need to get into Bible-believing doctrine and grow properly. You need to know the Word of God. The more familiar with, you are with the Word of God and how the Word of God guided other Bible believers, how they live their lives, you got a wealth of experience and arsenal and knowledge in your lap and you, you will tend to make fewer mistakes than those preachers did. Preachers have made a lot of mistakes, including yours truly. If I'm going to tell you or teach you something, it's something that I don't want you to follow in my same mistake. The greatest sin you will ever commit that follows what the Apostle Paul exactly did is to serve God very faithfully in your own way. That's the greatest thing you can ever do. Don't deceive yourself thinking that you please the Lord. Don't deceive yourself that you've been a blessing to people. Don't deceive yourself that uh, what you're doing is uh, helping out other people or something Christian. No, no. It is not. It is not. If I were to teach a wrong doctrine, if I were to hand out and give something that is wrong doctrinally or from a wrong teacher, I would do you all a disservice and I've wasted 10 years of my ministry. I'm going to give you Bible-believing truth, right doctrine, recommend you the right Bible-believing preachers and give you the right materials. That's what I'm going to be doing because that's my job is to assist you. And I'd be doing you a disservice I'd be offending you at the judgment seat of Christ when you tell me, Pastor, why didn't you tell me what I did was wrong? That's the job of our church. So if you're an Ananias, do that. Do that. Don't be judgmental. Don't be pharisaical. Just guide them. Just assist them. Be a blessing. Father God, I pray that the greatest sin of Paul will not be committed from this church. This church can boast, just like the church of Ephesus, of all its work and labor for you. But like you said, we left our first love. And I pray that will not be the case. Our first love is to you. You, not ourself. And that uh, we are, uh, obedience is much better than sacrifice. The first sin committed in the garden was disobedience. I pray that we will do what is right and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>